Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, addressing you from a gas station in central Kentucky with the pleasure of another episode of Marxism with fellow Providence editors and fellow Marx, Mark Leibecki, Mark Melton, reviewing three pieces from Providence this week. First, a piece uh, Defending America's Advocacy for Democracy by Alan Dowd. Secondly, an interview by Mark Melton with uh, Sam Goldman on his new book on America's self-understanding. And thirdly, a personal reflection by Mark Lebecki on his uh, personal acquaintance with the just deceased uh, famous or infamous Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. So first, starting out with uh, Alan Dowd's piece, I liked it a great deal. Uh, I think perhaps this is a distinction between Christian realist and the pure realist in that the pure realist would advocate a foreign policy largely divorced from democracy advocacy and premised on uh, a concept that uh, all nations follow their intrinsic self-interest irrespective of ideology. Uh, I think that the Christian realist, especially an American Christian realist, understands that America's self-understanding understanding is interwoven with our democratic identity and it's always been part of the uh, American soul that uh, we wish democracy not just for ourselves, but also for others, and that also within our self-interest for the world to be friendly to democracy, understanding it's unlikely the world will ever itself be fully democratic, but for the world, at least in uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, words, to be a safe place for democracy. But Mark Levecki, your thoughts? Absolutely that, uh, you know, it's Christian realism. It's both things. Uh, it doesn't discount the fact, you know, irrefutable, I think, history underlines this, stresses that nations, like individuals, are going to behave according to their interests. Uh, but when you understand that interests very often encompass values and that values can support those interests, then the Christian realist position, be, you know, comes uh, into greater clarity. Uh, Alan argues that it's in our interests to uh, cultivate, um, not accidentally fall into, but to actively cultivate strength, to have uh, the capacity uh, to project that strength and to demonstrate the credibility that we will use that strength when our interests or our alliances are at, put at risk. Uh, so that's important. He talks about the importance of friends, right? We need alliances. Uh, and uh, to go back to a distinction that uh, Bridge Colby made in an interview that Strand and I did with him some time back, um, it's not just alliances, but uh, you know we don't have to be besties with everybody. We could also have partnerships. So agreements with people that, with whom we share interests, say to hedge against China, uh, to form partnerships with them. So the value of friends, strength, friends, um, the unambiguous and articulated defense of uh, things that are important to us. So it is a, you know, it is a, a kind of grace for America to be committed to articulating very clearly those things uh, which we will defend and to unambiguously make those things known uh, to our adversaries so that they have an understanding of what they must not touch. Uh, this is the right kind of sort of lists that you give your adversaries. Uh, there are certain things that they must not do and they must recognize that we will punish them if they do. Uh, that's realistic. Um, that's a value that's in our interests. And then I think he talks about um, uh, just the value of ideas uh, and that you know various nations can coalesce not simply around interests, but about around shared uh, aspirations, shared principles, these sorts of things. Uh, and that even as we partner with nations with whom we don't necessarily share a lot of principles, maybe only interests in the moment, uh, maybe we can push, uh, you know, push the bubble a little further down the road and help them cultivate uh, principles and norms uh, that are more in line with our own. So, uh, you know, I think Alan Dowd's basic principle is sort of the Jim Mattis position. America should continually be a nation known uh, to be uh, a great friend uh, and a terrible enemy. And that's in our interests. And it, uh, it should be in accordance with our values. So, yeah, great article. Great argument for Christian realism. Mark Melton, you interviewed our uh, friend, George Washington University, a political scientist, uh, Sam Goldman, who is himself uh, 
Jewish and not necessarily religious, but has a profound understanding of America's uh, religious nature and has this fascinating new book on Amer various stages and epochs of America's uh, self-understanding, reminding us that America, in terms of polarization and division, this is not a new phenomenon, but uh, dates back to the very beginning. What did you, uh, Sam, uh, discuss exactly? All right, so we talk, talked about his book, which I actually reviewed in National Review. And uh, like you said, he talks about the different epochs or different, different ideas of what it means to be an American. He talks about covenantal uh, nationalism, a uh, crucible nationalism, and then a creedal nationalism. And I think there's probably others he could have talked about, but I feel like these are the main ones that can be positive visions of what America is, and also the ones that people might hear today. And uh, so reading this as a Southerner or as someone from the South was interesting because some of these ideas that I've heard since coming to DC seemed very distant to me and very, like I, I, growing up in the South, I wouldn't, I never heard about this covenantal idea. And so it was interesting reading like, well, that really came from New England and actually the South, even going, I mean, decades, you know, not that long ago, rejected it. Um, I think now they may kind of accept a certain vision of it, but mostly because of like a Christian idea. Um, I don't know if it would be a widespread idea, but most common, like where I'm from and what I'm used to is the creedal idea. In other words, the idea that America is founded upon the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, Republican government, separation of powers, all of these ideas of federalism, that's kind of like the creedal nationalism. And it really had his a peak, according to Goldman, in the 1940s and 50s during the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, because we were fighting this global ideological battle. And that since like then on, um, the United States has basically been reverting back to its normal set of divisions. And again, coming from the South, that is not a it, it makes sense to me that America has a lot of divisions. It feels like in the South, we are, we were constantly inundated with the idea that we are different from other people, from our accents to, uh, you know, our ideas and watching TV that becomes very obvious. And so to me, that's like, well, I just expect that to happen. And uh, the interesting thing with this is that it can change going into the future as well. Um, he doesn't talk so much about, he talks about his vision of America is basically going to be very localized, very focused on your local communities and churches. He wants more federalism. Um, he wants religious institutions and other associations to have more ability, more liberty to do their own thing. And uh, it seems to me like reading his book, I would forecast in the future, if America was to go into a no, another war, and when I mean that is like another massive war that requires mass mobilization, draft, um, have to coerce people who don't agree with you know, the creed or the vision, um, then we could have like this strong common identity. But unless that happens, it seems like it is normal. And I don't want to say that, yeah, I'm sure natural that a country that stretches across a continent that includes hundreds of millions of people from all these different backgrounds, um, they're not going to all see eye to eye. And that's the reason why federalism is important for America. Thank you, Mark Melton. And finally, uh, Mark Lavecki, uh, you knew and uh, were acquainted with Don Rumsfeld uh, through a program that his foundation administered. Uh, share a few memories about the late Don Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense under both Presidents Gerald Ford and George W. Bush. Yeah, it was a great privilege to, to be associated with him and with Joyce Rumsfeld and with the, uh, the network of graduate fellows that they supported. Uh, when he left office, uh, Donald Rumsfeld and his wife put together this foundation to support some of the things uh, that uh, they were grateful for in their own lives, to see those things um, enhanced, uh, both here at home, but also abroad. And some of these things were, you know, things like free markets, um, strong militaries, uh, militaries uh, that are taken care of uh, by those who uh, they support. So he, he funded organizations that supported wounded warriors, that helped uh, veterans transition into civilian life uh, through training and, 
and, and school, things like this. He also supported a team of graduate fellows. That is the network that I, I was a part of. And also Dan Strand, who writes for us all the time, and uh, Luba Miran Trishek. Uh, he was also one of these. Uh, and the aspiration here was to support the graduate work of people who were going into positions of public service, uh, who were going to intersect uh, the academy with um, some of the things that we do here, for instance, at Providence. And he also supported uh, about 10 different nations in greater Central Asia, um, helping uh, develop free markets, helping develop uh, leaders. This was always one of the ideas around which the, the Rumsfeld Foundation orbited, uh, that, that strong free nations require strong moral leadership and that those types of leaders aren't cultivated uh, accidentally. It has to be very intentional. And so he, he brought together all across the nation, all across the world, and helped try to develop them. Uh, I'll be writing something up uh, that'll be published later today. And the aspiration there is simply a little bit of personal reflection, uh, but also to push back against, you know, some of the uh, sort of the, the, the cruel things that are always said, it seems, nowadays, um, when, when people of high principle die. You know, uh, somebody like Donald Rumsfeld is not going to go through you know, nearly uh, 60 years of public service without you know, cultivating adversaries and enemies. And some of the vicious things that have been said uh, at his passing, eh, I'm not going to change anybody's mind, but I'm going to push back against them. Uh, he notes somewhere in one of his memoirs that uh, at one point in his life, when he was about 80, he had lived for almost one third the life of the United States, which points both to, as he said, his increased age, but also how simply young the nation is. What I find astonishing is that, you know, over his 88 years, um, Rumsfeld spent the vast majority of it in public service. Um, you know, he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave. And I understand that some people wish he gave less, um, but I hope to push against that narrative a little bit. Uh, his behavior on 9-11, when he could have taken shelter, but instead he ran out to the crash at the Pentagon uh, and he helped pull people from the rubble um, was extraordinary. Um, and then his support uh, for America's troops uh, was extraordinary. So I'll tell some of the stories that, that surround that. Thank you, Mark Levecki. We'll look forward to your article posting on Don Rumsfeld. And thank you, Mark Melton, both of you for another episode of Marxism. Until next week, bye-bye-bye. Take care.